Thank you all for coming today. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. I'm delighted to have you all here in person and on Zoom. As we gather today, we're all on indigenous lands. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. Those of us at the Museum of the White Mountains are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples. We're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on Zoom, Jade's put some links in the chat where you can learn more about indigenous histories of your place uh, at native-land.ca, as well as the Abenaki people of Northern New England through the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and the Musée de Abenaki in Quebec. Tonight, we're joined by Mac McClay, who's finishing officially will be finished on, I hear tonight, August 29th. So on August 29th, we all think good thoughts for Matt. Um, he'll be on uh, defending his master's thesis at Dartmouth in the Department of Earth Sciences. And as part of his thesis research on the Cannon Cliff, he's brought the old man into the virtual world with an amazing 3D model that we'll learn more about tonight. And I'm so excited he could join us tonight right before he's getting ready for his defense and before he moves to the West Coast. So we're, we're very glad to, to have him with us tonight. And our event tonight is made possible with support from New Hampshire Humanities in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. To learn more, I encourage you to look at uh, their website, which is nhhumanities.org. And that is enough for me. I will start our share so we can look at all these great slides. Mm -hmm. so if you just do from the current slide, that should be. Yeah. <clears throat> There we go. Okay. In good shape. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you this evening. Thank you for joining for joining me and for joining us here at the Museum of the White Mountains. It's really uh, wonderful to be here. So uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about um, a lot of work that's been done in the last year. I'm doing my best to sort of share a little bit about this research and uh, a little bit about Cannon Cliff and uh, all of the amazing different data sets that have come out of this work. Um, and as Megan mentioned, I'm defending my thesis in a little over a month. So there's a lot of thoughts running through my mind right now. So for better or for worse, there's a lot of plots, a lot of data, and uh, I'll try and like hold your hand as we go through the weeds here. So um, yeah, so just wanna right away, let me see if I can hide this bar. Let's see, I think. Loading middle controls. There we go. Um, so, yeah. So right away, I just want to say this project could not, would not have been possible without tremendous support from so many people. Uh, my advisor at Dartmouth, Marissa Pelusis, so many other collaborators at Dartmouth, um, and uh, fellow graduate students who helped me in the field. Brian Fowler, who's here tonight. Tom Davis, who's here tonight. These, uh, so many people have made this project possible and it's been an incredible collaboration with all kinds of organizations in the area. So um, I'm really, really grateful to have been a part of it and for all that we've been able to do. Okay, so this is back, let's see, <laughs> one more time. All right, so um, just to, a little bit of a roadmap for what I'm gonna talk about tonight. I'm gonna introduce Cannon Cliff, uh, though I think most of you at least have seen it, um, but we'll introduce it from a sort of geologic perspective. What does an earth scientist see when they look at Cannon Cliff? Uh, I'm gonna talk about bedrock weathering and rockfall um, and kind of like why those things matter, why I'm studying those, what those things are. Um, and then I'm gonna dive right into what we've done in the last year. Um, 3D modeling, temperature analysis, geological surveys, these sort of data sets that have come out of this are really fascinating and um, can teach us and help us learn about the cliff and these processes that are sort of acting upon it. So, and then I'll wrap up with some preliminary conclusions and talk a little bit about what's next. So here's Cannon Cliff, um, a beautiful cliff just about maybe 20 minutes from here probably. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely just drive 20 minutes north on 93. You won't miss it. Um, it's the western flank of Franconia Notch. 
um, and it's truly massive. It's about uh, almost a thousand feet tall at the, at the middle portion there on the big wall and three quarters of a mile across. So um, truly massive. And in fact, it's so big that it feels like it's looming over you when you're on the, the highway there. Um, it's actually set back quite far from the road. It's even bigger than you think is what I'm trying to say. Um, but half of what we're seeing in this image right now is actually not the cliff itself, but it's all this debris that's fallen down and rocks, and that's the talus. We call it the talus slope. And it's essentially a huge pile of rocks. And um, if we look at satellite imagery, so a top-down view, you can see that the actual area, if you look at this top left panel, uh, the actual area of the cliff itself is relatively small because it's close to vertical, whereas the area of the talus slope is huge. So there's been all this debris that's been piling up for at least the last 10 to 12,000 years since the last ice sheet retreated from Franconia Notch. So this talus ranges in size from gravel and sand to boulders bigger than cars. Here's uh, Brian climbing up the talus with me on one of our uh, first fieldwork expeditions, um, a rather treacherous climb. But just to give you a sense of scale, we're kind of like over here on the right. Um, looking up at the cliff, and it's this is a lot of material that's fallen off of Cannon. And it's a testament to how much rockfall takes place here. There's a ton of rockfall at Cannon. It's one of the most dynamic landscapes probably in the White Mountains. Um, and this is an example. So this is from a 1997, quite a recent rockfall. Um, the upper pitches of Whaleback Crack, which is a sort of popular climbing route, or once was, um, Came, came crashing down uh, in 1997 and stopped just a few feet from Franconia Notch bike path right there, um, which is a great bike path for many reasons, but including you see a ton of cool boulders like this uh, from both the Lafayette and the Cannon sides of the trail. Um, and it's uh, really fascinating. So in addition to rockfall though, there's bedrock weathering taking place. And so before I go any further, that's in the title of my talk and I've been, um, uh, sort of mentioning it, I want to talk about, okay, what is bedrock weathering? What does that mean? And so when I'm talking about weathering, I am referring to the breaking down and dissolving of rocks and minerals. And um, we kind of break this process up mostly into two different components. So physical weathering, which refers to not altering the composition of a material, but just breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces. So for example, on the left here is root wedging. Um, essentially a tree growing out of this has, like the roots have wedged this rock apart without changing the chemistry or the composition of this material. And then another example would be freeze thaw or frost uh, weathering where ice can break apart rock. On the other side, there's chemical weathering. And this is where the actual composition of the rock or a material changes. So here on the left is an image of the day the old man of the mountain collapsed. Uh, Brian Fowler pointed this out in his 2005 paper that all this material you see on here, uh, we call grus. It's essentially clay, dirt, sand. It's the remains of what was once granite and has been chemically dissolved and altered. And essentially the degradation of that granite, probably through water in this fracture here, um, eventually led to the collapse of the old man. And over here on the right, there's Tom Davis. Uh, we are looking up and looking at some interesting residues from water coming down on the cliff, just to sort, sort of show that the chemistry is alive. There's stuff that's changing on the surface of these rocks. In reality, it's not either or. Um, things are happening and it's a combination. Um, over here on the left, I uh, thought I was super strong when I uh, took a, a rock hammer swing and was trying to get a sample. Uh, it came off really easily. Turns out uh, <laughs> there was a little weed here that had grown in. And uh, this is all dirt and roots right here where the, my sample came from. I, had, I was not expecting that at all. Um, and that's a great example of both, right? So like it's literally producing its own soil right there. Um, it's the roots are growing, it's wedging apart the rock. And it's also dissolving minerals and cations and doing all kinds of interesting chemistry to the rock as well. And over here is just my favorite picture. You'll see it over and over again because it really shows soil production in action. This is from the base of the talus slope where you can see granite from you know, rocks to gravel all the way down to soil. So 
Okay, I'm talking about breaking down rock, dissolving it, crushing it, crumbling it. Like, why does this matter? Um, believe it or not, people actually travel all over the world to study this because it's really important for a whole bunch of reasons. And I'll just give a couple, but one reason is that I just showed this photo, but it generates soil. So this is how soil is made. We use soil, the global population depends on soil for feeding, uh, feeding everybody, we grow our crops in soil. And without bedrock weathering, there's no new soil. This is how soil is made. Um, a second reason is climate. So there, the actual chemistry of what goes on when rocks are dissolved and broken down and uh, different uh, minerals and elements are put into streams and eventually go into our lakes and rivers and, um, and ocean, there's actually um, atmospheric exchange that can happen and it can really impact the carbon cycle. So understanding the rates of weathering uh, has a big implication for what's going on in our atmosphere in terms of how much CO2 there is. Um, and then finally, landscape evolution is really, that basically understanding why there are valleys where, where they are and why there are mountains where there are, uh, it comes down to, in some, in some way, bedrock weathering and its ability to resist erosion and weathering. And I think the old man of the mountain is a fantastic case study of bedrock weathering because here we have something this icon of New Hampshire and of New England that was formed through bedrock weathering, right? All this material around it was removed. And then eventually the weathering removed the old man himself and he came tumbling down 20 years ago. So kind of an interesting um, case study of just thinking about, yeah, this is, uh, it also impacts sort of natural hazards and, and is uh, just interesting to consider. So in the White Mountains here, um, we have a very intense weathering environment. <laughs> As many of you can probably guess, um, we have very cold, harsh winters and we have warm, wet summers. And so that can support all different kinds of weathering. So we have, I mentioned some like ice stuff, like fr uh, frost weathering, and then also, um, you know, chemical weathering, which is tends to prefer warm and like wet climates. So there's a lot going on here in the whites. But when we apply this to Canon, the question is, okay, so what is the story? Why, why do we have so much rockfall? Is it freeze thaw? Is it uh, like frost weathering or is it chemical weathering? What's going on? Why is it such an efficient place for rockfall? This talus slope here is actually the biggest of its kind in all of the Eastern United States. So this is really fascinating. And we wanna understand a little bit about um, why that is. So the sort of standard answer you'll get is sort of saying, okay, well, we haven't really studied Canon, but it's similar to uh, Yosemite. And this is an image of Half Dome. And you can see these layers here of, of granite, these layers. And what, what we'll say at Canon is, okay, it's probably exfoliating is the word. And basically these granite uh, uh, plutons formed deep underground under pressure. And the idea is that when you glaciate the region and there's all this erosion and you bring it to the surface and it, you release the pressure, these layers kind of like peel off almost like an onion. And so that's one thing that um, has been said a long time about Canon. Oh, it's exfoliating. Another thing that's been said for a long time is freeze thaw. Okay, we know there's a ton of snow and a ton of water in New England. And um, the idea with freeze thaw is that uh, water gets into the cracks of the rock freezes, wedges the rock apart. Uh, when it thaws, it sinks in deeper and it freezes again and it, it uh, wedges it apart more and kind of this process repeats. Um, both of these ideas uh, have been pointed to for a really long time. They've never really been tested or um, actually sort of measured or documented in, in, uh, at Canon. Um, and actually they're both kind of uh, still very much debated in the bedrock weathering community. People are trying to understand this process. So um, with this project, we wanted to test this and sort of see, okay, what weathering processes do we think are happening at Canon? And how does that control uh, rockfall? And do the, how do they depend on temperature? So what are the primary weathering mechanisms at Canon Cliff? Um, to sort of go at this, we had three main objectives. So we wanted to survey the cliff. That includes field work um, and looking at the sort of geology and the context, uh, measure volumetric changes, which is where we'll start talking about some of the 3D modeling that we've done, 
and then also measure bedrock temperature because a lot of these processes are really temperature dependent, but we have virtually no bedrock temperature data in New England that I'm aware of. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's not collected very, um, very often, so. Cool. So hopefully with this, uh, with these objectives, we can sort of answer the question, okay, what's driving rockfall and weathering at Canon? Because it's so efficient. All right, so surveying the cliff. Um, so just to start, um, I want to give us some geologic context. This is the only geologic map, I believe, um, of Cannon Cliff and of Franconia Notch. So Cannon is right there, I've circled it. Um, this was made in the early 30s, I think near the end of the Great Depression by uh, Marlon Billings, <laughs> a famous geologist at Harvard. Um, and it's pretty simple. I mean, he got it right, it's Conway granite. Um, it's a coarse grained pink biotite granite, and it doesn't have any amphibole. These are like minerals in the granite, um, but it has a lot of potassium feldspar. Um, and yeah, it was uh, investigated as a, as a resource for thorium at one point, when that was something that the, the government needed. Um, but that map pretty much just painted this whole area pink and said it's Conway granite. And uh, when you get out into the field, or even maybe in this photo, if you look at the cliff, you can sort of imagine like geologically, this is the bedrock here. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And um, there's actual really good examples of that. And so I just wanna take us on a little tour here of some of the features of the cliff that make things a little more complicated than that um, sort of simple story. And the first location is the famous location um, this is Whitney Gilman Ridge here, and it is blocking this huge gully through the cliff called the Black Dyke. And so this is a picture of the Black Dyke. And um, so now Whitney Gilman Ridge, which is a climbing route, is here on the left. Um, this whole thing fills up with ice. People ice climb it in the winter. But the reason it's here is because it's an intrusion of a different type of rock. So this is a diabase intrusion. It's a shiny black rock, looks nothing like granite. And um, in this photo, it's kind of hard to see, but I've outlined where a little bit of diabase remains. The reason this gully is here is because we're, this is a sort of a plane of weakness in the rock, and that's why the intrusion was there. And subsequently, it's been preferentially weathered, and the diabase is softer, so it's weathered out. And this is sort of similar to the Flume Gorge, if you've been over there to check that out. Um, so there's one example of how it's not as simple as uh, just, <laughs> this isn't just granite. And also notice in this image, just how heavily fractured this region is. There's fractures everywhere and there's all this debris. Um, in contrast, I'll take us to the other side of the cliff here in a region called the slabs, which are much more reminiscent of Yosemite than what we were looking at before. So these giant sheets um, are basically layers of the granite and they're incredibly strong and, and it's some of the hardest granite on the cliff. And just for fun and for scale, you can see some climbers uh, making their way up uh, Lakeview, I think would be the climbing route there. Um, gives you a sense of how big <laughs> the cliff is. You can hardly see them. Um, yeah, and so this is just a totally different looking landscape in a way. It's the same rock, totally different looking. So this is um, a really complicated environment in the field. Um, and then finally, I just want to give some context for where we are. We're in Franconia Notch. And the reason it's a notch is because it has this incredible geologic and glacial history. So uh, the Laurentide Ice Sheet um, retreated from this area only 10 or 12,000 years ago, which is in a geologic sense very recently. Um, and it's actually uh, probably been glaciated several times, maybe four or five times. And um, these notches form because the glaciers squeeze through here, eroding the valley floor and kind of creating additional topography and over steepening the edges. So um, you can't really talk about Cannon Cliff without thinking about the glacial history because it probably, uh, the glacier probably sheared off a lot of material when it was moving through here and we wouldn't have had a talus slope. So yet another reason why um, we know that there must've been a lot of rock fall since. So, um, and then, okay, so I just wanna show a couple more field observations. Um, so these are just other interesting places where you have 
these sort of contact uh, metamorphism or, or these intrusions going on of highly different, uh, just extremely different rocks cutting through the Conway granite. Um, and then additionally over here, this is potential faults maybe with um, like uh, much higher fracture density. Um, and I'm just trying to give you a sense of how it looks like a wall from far away, but when you get up there, it's really um, a complicated surface to try and understand. Um, here is a really interesting example. So this is um, right above where the old man was. In fact, you can see this is part of the concrete sort of sluice way that was designed to divert water away from the old man. So the old man's just below this image. And you can see on one boulder here, we have very intact pink looking, plastic looking granite. And then we have this extremely weathered area where you see these big cracks that have developed and there's lichens and it's a different color and it's quite crumbly. Um, and so as one of our measurements that we, we made, um, we measured bedrock strength uh, or we estimated the strength rather of the bedrock using something called a Schmidt hammer, um, which is actually designed for testing concrete. Um, it basically smacks the rock and measures how much it bounces back. And if you have something that's crumbly, it doesn't bounce back very much. If you hit into a solid piece of granite, it bounces back a lot. So what's interesting is this is a single block here. And uh, when we compare the Schmidt hammer measurements, it's undeniable that this is essentially in a totally different domain in terms of its how weathered it is and the strength of the granite. So this is fascinating because this is such a short, that's my backpack for scale. It's such a short distance away. Um, and it's incredibly different material. Um, again, this is again underneath, here's the this water uh, diverging sluiceway thing. Um, here is some really intact uh, classic pink granite. Here's this heavily weathered block. And again, taking strength measurements with the Schmidt hammer, we see that it's totally different. Um, you know, it's it's amazing. These blocks are close to each other. <laughs> How did, the, did this one experience something drastically different than this one? Who knows? Um, so this is adding to the puzzle and sort of just to give you a sense of uh, uh, how, how diverse this environment is. Um, so one of the first things we did in this project to try and, and map all this stuff, get it all uh, captured because it's such a dynamic landscape with all these different features was uh, create a 3D model of the cliff. And for this, we, we did drone surveys. So um, here we are using uh, Jesse Cassana's drone. He's a, an archeologist in the uh, Department of Anthropology at Dartmouth. And he, he does a lot of really, really cool work um, using remote sensing and various other uh, techniques to look for, um, archeo for archeological purposes. Um, and uh, we, <laughs> We convinced him to join this project and use his drone for Cannon Cliff. He's from New Hampshire, so he was on board and very supportive. Um, and yeah, so we flew this um, this drone and had a pretty complicated flight plan. Uh, you have to fly up uh, pretty high to map a cliff if you're flying from the valley floor, um, much higher than the 400 foot ceiling that you normally have. Um, so of course we had a permit to do this and we coordinated um, with the local authorities, but we're working doing this very complicated vertical scan flight plan where we do these terraces, kind of working our way down the cliff back and forth, taking thousands of images. And the reason this was really, this was really a fruitful effort, um, we were able to create a really detailed 3D model of the cliff. And this essentially establishes a geomorphic baseline. So as future rock falls occur, or if we uncover photographs of a different area, we can sort of compare and say, okay, like, let's see how this is changing, or let's, uh, this climbing route used to go this way, where does it go now? <laughs> so it's, it's pretty neat. And it's, um, it's something that uh, I think people will be looking at and using for a long time. So with this model, we can also measure volume change. And so this is sort of inspired um, by uh, this paper that some folks out uh, at Yosemite did. And they used, uh, they crowdsourced images of the Yosemite Valley and they got hundreds, maybe thousands of images. And they were able to um, say, oh, that flake used to be here in this image and in this image, but not anymore. 
Uh, how big was that rockfall? Can we figure out when it fell? And that's one thing they did, and that's what these colors are showing, is like when it fell. So, um, and then the other thing they did was actually recreate it in 3D and, and measure the volumes of how much material was lost. So um, it's really cool work and it inspired um, some of what we did with our 3D modeling, which is there's a lot of images of the old man of the mountain, which is maybe the most iconic rock fall of all time, <laughs> um, certainly around here. And uh, essentially by uh, working with Brian and the old man of the mountain legacy fund, we were able to source some really incredible uh, film negatives and old images of the old man. And the reason these images are special is because 99% of images are taken from that far right view, the classic profile view, because that's what everyone saw. Um, but in uh, 1958, 1976, and a couple times in between, there was actually helicopter support um, that documented work being done to preserve and work on the old man. And these images um, give us these unique angles that most people have never seen before and or had never seen before. And um, also enable uh, photogrammetry, which is this process where if you have converging photos of an object, you can reconstruct its three-dimensional geometry using parallax, the same way that we have uh, depth perception because our eyes are offset. So this is a really cool um, technique and it was very um, fruitful in that we got this uh, 3D model that reconstructed the old man. And um, if you haven't checked this out, you should totally check it out. It's online. I'll have a QR code at the end. And it's actually also upstairs here <laughs> at the museum. Uh, there's a little booth where you can scroll through it and interact with it. So um, this was a really big hit. People have uh, given me a lot of positive feedback about it. And um, you can... Uh, definitely would recommend playing with it. Um, so in addition, oops, let's see, over here. So in addition to actually just sort of uh, publicly sharing and, and capturing the old man's likeness, there's actually a lot of sort of science we can do with this. Um, one of which is we're able to measure the dimensions with great accuracy and great safety of the old man. Um, and these measurements we got actually are within a few percent of what Brian got, um, I think in 1976, if I'm right, um, which is pretty amazing. And I think uh, mostly a testament to Brian and being able to make some uh, impressive measurements uh, while hanging from ropes and using a tape measure in the wind on a 24 degree uh, slanting surface. So um, this is a lot easier for me. I just point and click and, you know, sort of do my best on the computer. But um, so that's pretty cool to verify those measurements. And also it um, confirms uh, some of what Brian had uh, found back then, which is um, that, you know, the, the stability of the rock mass there uh, wasn't under threat due to highway construction at the time, which was sort of the big question. Um, and then I've been hinting at this and kind of mentioning it, but uh, we can also do direct uh, volume uh, measurements. So before and after is essentially what we're doing, but in 3D. And in doing that, we're able to measure for the first time how much material was actually lost when the old man fell. And it's about 740 cubic meters which is, uh, doesn't mean much to most people. <laughs> so um, that, that amount of volume is more than five school buses in, in terms of size. It's a huge amount of material. And that amount of granite is unbelievably heavy, 2000 tons, uh, more than the space shuttle it launched is the one I like to use. <laughs> so it's really uh, impressive amount of material. Um, so the reason this was possible was not just because of the historical photos, but also because of this new uh, 3D model that's very accurately geo-referenced um, of the cliff. And so what I'm really excited about, I mentioned this, we've established this geomorphic baseline for future work, but I kind of zoomed in there to, I think, where whaleback crack came off. Um, I'm excited about this because um, this is gonna be uh, used for all kinds of other activity that happens on the cliff. Who knows where the next rock fall might be, but we have this now and we can measure the, the volumes of those rock falls, as well as map um, other uh, activities on the cliff, like where my sensors are and all kinds of things, mapping the geology, the structures. You can do a lot of that remotely now. So really, really cool. 
Okay, so I'm going to transition now into what we've done to measure bedrock temperature. And this is where it gets a little plot heavy, but uh, stick with me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so basically what we did for measuring bedrock temperature was affix these tiny little sensors um, on the base of the cliff and on the crest of the cliff. So here is um, another model of the cliff here, and we've uh, the orange points are where the temperature sensors are. And there are these little eye buttons that measure a um, data point every 10 minutes. So, and they record it locally um, and they can hold years worth of data. It's really impressive. Um, and I have found that they are incredible. Like I'm so blown away with their ability to be glued up onto a rock and stay out in a New Hampshire winter on a mountain and come down and work and then also be incredibly accurate. So this is um, looking at three different eye buttons from, uh, I guess, September to uh, December of last year. And they're from different places on the cliff. One's from where the old man was, and some are from the uh, bottom of the cliff. And I was immediately sort of surprised to see that they actually all track quite well. And in fact, they're really, really um, closely correlated with just the um, the the sensors near the bottom of the cliff having higher highs um, and you know, and the old man having lower lows, but for the most part, it's within a few degrees. So this is really interesting because it seems like bedrock temperature is not incredibly variable spatially. Um, so now I'm looking at a single sensor and this is from where the old man was. So we had a sensor glued up there and this is from October through uh, June. So this is, we're getting the full winter here. And what we're looking at is the 10 minute data. So we're seeing all this scatter. This is like, you know, warm days. And it's, it's, uh, this is over time. And um, what I've plotted in blue over it is all the data points that fall within this window called the frost cracking window, where we think there's going to be preferential um, uh, essentially weathering due to ice and, and the, the frost cracking. So um, this is really uh, interesting because frost cracking is a process that's studied in the Arctic. It's studied in paraglacial areas at higher latitudes. It hasn't really been studied in mid latitudes because it's kind of like, oh, is it, is it happening? Who knows? But I mean, what we're seeing is there's 61 cumulative days uh, of frost cracking happening here, which is quite a bit. That's more than some places in the Arctic. Um, because in the Arctic, it's too cold <laughs> in some places. Um, but the sort of asterisk here is that, okay, well, this is just at the surface. I didn't drill meters into the bedrock and install sensors. And you could do that. It would be a lot of work and a lot of drill bits at Canon, but you could do that. Um, but instead, <laughs> we didn't do that. And so we have surface temperature. And the way we can sort of estimate the subsurface temperature requires getting more data. And so um, Hubbard Brook, uh, long-term ecological research site, and the experimental forest is just, I guess, 10 or 15 minutes from here and 15 miles from Cannon. And it's been gathering air temperature data for almost 70 years. So um, what I did was look at how the air temperature in the last year, when I've been gathering this bedrock temperature data, how has it um, how does it track at Hubbard Brook with what I'm seeing on the, on the old man? And um, I did a, an elevation correction, a lapse rate correct, correction. So it's colder when you climb a mountain because of the lapse rate, air gets colder at higher elevations. Um, and so I corrected for that and I essentially plotted it. And I was like, whoa, we got something here. Um, it's highly correlated, which is really interesting. So what I did is quantify that correlation and I did it for daily um, mean temperature, min, and maximum temperature. So they'll have the high, the low, and the mean temperature of every day. And they pretty much all fall on the same, just about on the same curve here, the same line with some noise, especially in the max temperature. But uh, these are all statistically significant relationships um, that are uh, pretty well constrained. And I was totally blown away that they all fit on the same line. Um, so this is really cool. Basically, what this means is that with 70 years of air temperature data from Hubbard Brook, 
I can say, oh, on you know January 1962, January 3rd, 1962, I can go here and say, oh, it was uh, negative five Celsius. Well, that means the mean uh, bedrock temperature was uh, around zero or around negative one. So what I've done here is create a calibration. And so the exciting part is applying it, which is what I do here. So um, basically going back in 70 years of data, I looked at how many, for each year, how many days were we in the, the frost cracking window at Canon? Or how many days did we have freeze thaw going on? And also, what was the bedrock temperature over time? So this is uh, from 1955 to today. And what we see is pretty interesting. Um, we'll start at the bottom here because this is bedrock temperature. Bedrock temperature is increasing at just about the same rate as air temperature. And with that, we're actually seeing um, a pretty significant decrease in the number of days where we're in the frost cracking window. And what I was really excited about, this was literally today I was working on this, um, with this new way of calculating uh, days in the frost cracking window, we ended up right at 60, which is exactly what I measured this year. So that's pretty cool. It makes me feel like this is uh, grounded in some, at least in some, at least on the right side is grounded in reality. Um, so this is a pretty exciting uh, thing for somebody who's interested in bedrock temperature because I'm going way back in time. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then here is another way of, uh, of looking at this. And what this allows us to do is understand what are the seasonal averages. So this is looking at all 70 years of data on a single annual curve. And what we see is that, okay, the red line in the middle is the sort of mean. So typically over the last uh, you know, 70 years, on average, in early January, we're close to negative eight, negative 10 um, Celsius. And in the peak of the summer, day of year 200, I don't want to do the math on what that is, probably July or August, <laughs> um, uh, we're close to 18 degrees. And this is all bedrock temperature. So with this, now, finally, I can estimate at depth what's going on. So this is all for the surface. But because now I have this sort of oscillation, this, this pattern, I uh, can plug it into a model. And basically, what we're measuring, so we're on the y-axis is depth. So you can imagine we're going underground here. Um, this is the surface, and we're going underground. And then here is temperature. And uh, basically, what we have are data from the surface. And so over time, which is what these curves are showing, um, we're going back and forth over here. In the winter, it gets cold at the surface, and in the summer, it gets warm. Uh, but that signal um, and how it propagates is uh, defined by the diffusivity uh, of the granite. And so this is a pretty simple mathematical model, uh, essentially a damped oscillator, where we say, okay, if our period here is a year, and our average goes from um, around five to around 15 and all the way back up to uh, 18 or so. Um, what does the actual, how deep does that signal propagate? And what we see is that um, basically only about the top meter, maybe two meters, uh, get to these temperatures that are required for frost cracking to be taking place. So, um, this is very much just a back of the envelope kind of model, but I think it's interesting because we're estimating uh, the actual depth where frost cracking could be occurring potentially. Um, and this is pretty generous, I would say, as a, as a model goes, because um, every day there's oscillations as well. So, um, so yeah, so basically in terms of the temperature um, uh, sort of data, uh, frost cracking is shallow and it's decreasing over time is what we've seen um, in, in at Cannon. And uh, the other thing we've seen is that there's really high variation in rock strength at short length scales. So the same rock, the same one rock from another, but there's fairly uniform temperatures across the cliff. And so essentially um, it might be the temperature and temperature variation doesn't, is, does not alone explain the sort of variability. Of, of what's taking place here. So um, 
I showed this before. This is what I mean when I say high variation in a, in a small area, a small distance. This rock is pretty much all at the same temperature and it experiences the same uh, oscillations and swings. So something else has to be going on here. And this is where this project is going. Um, so this is uh, hot off the press. I'm working with a scanning electron microscope and trying to understand um, if there's actual differences in the granite that we're starting with, as opposed to um, you know, it being a temperature-based solution. And so here, what we're looking at is um, an image of one of the more intact pieces of granite. It's pretty smooth and flat, and this is a grain boundary. So if I go to the next slide here, you can see um, that uh, we're mapping minerals here. On the left is silica, and this is a really silica-rich mineral. It's probably quartz. It's probably a quartz grain. And this is um, feldspar to the right, which is much more susceptible to weathering. But again, if we look at this image, it's actually in pretty good shape. And this checks out. This is one of the intact samples from that hard pink area. Um, on the other hand, this is a really heavily weathered sample, and I'm really interested and I was really excited when I saw this because there's all this, and I'll zoom in in a second, but there's all this um, micro fracturing and topography that's going on here. And one thing in particular, so this is from a weathered region on Canon. One thing that's, um, so this is uh, a feldspar here um, and uh, quartz around it. Um, but if I zoom in here, if I zoom in on this black blob here, this is really fascinating. So you can see a hexagonal structure. And um, that is because it's quartz. That's, the quartz is a crystal structure. If you've ever seen a giant quartz crystal, it's uh, usually a hexagon. So um, what's fascinating here is that the feldspar around it is incredibly weathered. Um, it's got this pitting, it's sort of etching. Um, and there's these intrusions, these, uh, these quartz intrusions, and this grain, which is off the surface, is probably like that because the feldspar has weathered around it, and uh, it has these deep sort of pitted surfaces. So I don't have a ton of conclusions other than to show that this is really exciting stuff, and the actual microscopic scale, the granite is very different. Um, yeah, so here's just another uh, <laughs> mineral thing there. And then here's XRF. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not XRF. That's um, so I think they use electrons. It's they they blast it with it's blasted with electrons and then it re-emits. It excites the electrons of the minerals and they re-emit. But I I don't know the details of that. So it's a point and click machine. It's amazing. <laughs> Very easy to it's use. Not a uh, I don't believe so. But I'll have to, I'll, we should chat, uh, chat about it. Um, another sort of exciting and cool thing that I would like to do more of. So this is another strength test. This is uh, the old man failure surface and me kind of hanging on here carefully. Um, but this is uh, one of the failure surfaces uh, where the old man once was. And when I did the strength test here, um, in, the, in the only safe way I could, which was being totally seated, obviously, on the cliff, um, I got a really low number. It's really degraded. And so when I compared this to a lot of the other places I was looking, um, you know, crumbly rock, intact rock, uh, weathered, and but looks intact, but it's very weathered. And then the failure surface, this was like actually the lowest one I got. So I'm fascinated about that. And maybe we can learn a little bit more about um, why the old man uh, collapsed the way that he did. Um, okay, so key takeaways and wrapping up. <laughs> um, I guess the first one is that Canon is a really dynamic environment. Um, there's so much rockfall going on and it's really, uh, it's a dangerous place, um, but it's an incredible natural laboratory for studying this kind of stuff, for bedrock, studying bedrock weathering and rockfall. Um, and the old man of the mountain has been an amazing case study to think about this uh, because there was work that Brian and others did um, uh, you know, previously and all this documentation. So it's been a really cool thing to think about. Um, uh, bedrock temperature support that frost weathering and frost cracking definitely can be taking place. There's potential for it, um, but it's shallow. 
and its degree is probably decreasing. So we're, we're in a regime now in terms of the climate where it's warming, the amount of frost cracking and its potential to be working on these rocks is decreasing. Um, there's a lot of variation in the rock characteristics at really short scales, and they can't be described, they can't be explained by temperature alone. So there has to be something else going on. And my bullet here says geologic context, a geological context matters, and that's obvious. But I mean, I think what we're getting at here is that um, the way this rock formed is really complicated. And we actually, that story that, oh, it's just an exfoliating granite dome like Yosemite, um, and there's freeze thaw, you know. Uh, that might be uh, quite an oversimplification uh, of what's going on at Canon. So, and then finally, um, yeah, so basically what I just said, but differences in the granite are probably uh, what's behind the, the weathering and rockfall rates uh, more, and we need to examine that more. So, um, and here's a QR code. If you scan it, it'll take you to the 3D model of the old man and, and the cliff, and you can zoom around. Um, but with that, thank you guys so much for listening to my <laughs> mini thesis defense. And uh, yeah, it's been really great to be here. Thank you. And happy to take questions. Yeah, of course. We, have, we have some time for questions. We want to not wander from the mic. Oh, yep. Um, are there questions here in person? We can also um, take questions in the chat or folks can uh, unmute if they, if they want to ask. Yeah, and I can, here's this for inspiration. You can look at that and be hypnotized. <laughs> yes. I have a question about the image that showed uh, taking the photos, um, starting like the lines. I mean, mm -hmm. Is that a program that generated that? Or? Yeah, yeah, it was. So um, with these kind of drone flights um, and in this kind of environment, it's a pretty, uh, a lot of a lot of drone flights take place in very safe, simple environments. Uh, Franconia Notch is not that. In terms of the airspace, there's a lot going on. Um, so it's a pre-programmed flight path. So what we do is the drone has a GPS on it and it knows where it's going. And what we do most of the time, <laughs> and what we do is um, pre-program a flight path that will it will follow, and then we're just monitoring it. And that's all software that's on my computer, and I send it to the drone. It kind of does the computations on board. It's pretty amazing. So did um, you work with John before? Was that a steep learning curve? Um, I hadn't really, but I've been uh, adjacent to drones, but I've never done it myself. So yeah, it's definitely been a skill that I've learned for sure. Yeah. So in, in preparing you for your defense, I want to ask you about something you didn't talk about. Great. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I feel like you raised the specter of by talking about Hubbard Brook. So where does acid rain fit into? So you, you kind of, you know, you, you focus more on the physical side of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if there's, if there's something you, if there's a piece of this story that ties in with not just Hubbard Brooks' amazing temperature data, but Hubbard Brooks' amazing water data yes. and what we've learned about acid rain, you know, how that was present in our region, how that's changed, you know, improved, thankfully. Um, so is there a chemical story yeah. you can tease out of this Absolutely. that connects to that? Absolutely, yeah. So I haven't dug into Hubbard, all of Hubbard Brooks' data because there's yeah. so much. Um, and there are people, you know, whose careers are producing papers with Hubbard Brook data. So um, it's amazing what they do there. Um, I will say that there's absolutely a story to be teased out of that. And um, especially, I mean, in terms of the chemical weathering, um, I, it does relate to the sort of uh, what I sort of ended on with the actual um, composition of the granite being different in different locations and, and different um, you know, these fractures where we have quartz intrusions, um, that essentially uh, means that there's micro fractures going on in the granite, which are susceptible to chemical weathering. As far as the acid rain, um, I don't really, I'm not up on what the trends are with the acid rain and how acidic exactly. they're rain. I'm really glad to hear it. Um, but I will say that all rain is mildly acidic. And so there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, obviously. Um, and some of that is um, basically suspended in aqueous solution in the water. And that carbonic acid 
um, interacts chemically and actually chemically weathers the granite. So that is absolutely a factor. And that's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting question. I want to look into that, look at the acid rain trends. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, as I'm sure you know, there's lots of data. Yeah. <laughs> there's lots of data. Or CSVs yeah. for me to download. 60, More plots. 60 years of water samples as of this July. So right. we've, got, we've got lots of data there. Yeah. Other other questions? Thanks. I have a question about the swimming. Just that have, have similar studies have been done in the study. You said that you know that everyone thought it was exfoliating granite, just like the Yosemite. But is that really true of Yosemite too? Yeah. Have there been studies about what that's used up? Sure, yeah, there have been. There's been a lot of really um wonderful work. Um Greg Stock and Brian Collins are the names that come to mind. Um, they've done really cool work studying rockfall. In Yosemite, rockfall is a real hazard. It is a canon too, but in Yosemite, there are buildings and structures as part of the park infrastructure. They're actually, um, now they've been shut down, but they're in places where uh, they basically could have been hit by a rockfall at any given time. So what they found in Yosemite is pretty um, fascinating. So um, the sort of typical model for rockfall is like, oh, there was an earthquake or a big rain, like rain event. And now all this rock and material has been mobilized and there's a big rock fall. Um, that's true. But they had all these rock falls at Yosemite that were happening at pretty much, there was no triggering event. There was nothing they could link it to. And there was this really fascinating study that came out where they put um, what they call crack meters in between flakes of the granite. So there's actual gaps between the flake of the granite and the rest of the cliff. And they put this device that measures that distance and they also put a temperature sensor. And um, on the hottest days of the year, basically with temperature oscillations and the sun beating down on it, those flakes actually expand and contract. And so what they found is that there was like, I forgot, like a 50% increase on the random sort of expected amount of rockfall to occur on the hottest days of the year because these things actually peel and flake off. So in a way, it is absolutely exfoliating. Um, and that's that's part of it. I mean, the flakes are predisposed to that. And I think that's still true at Canon. It's just that there's a lot more to the story. Um, yeah. So has it could be that there's been studies like on arches and sandstone as opposed to granite. Have you seen any of that where they're trying to predict and parts mm. where rocks going to fall on people? But it, it would be completely different. It is completely different. different. It's not exfoliation, it's not granite. Just yeah. Granite. I just wondered if you seen any of that. Yeah, well, so, I mean, to be perfectly honest, when I started the study, I was not really thinking about granite, which is hilarious in hindsight, because it's so, it's right at the, the core of it, but I was just thinking about the processes. I was thinking about the, the weathering, you know, and like, uh, where, where is frost cracking happening? Um, the reality is, it absolutely is medium dependent. So, sandstone, shale, slate, you know, different types of rock are going to have entirely different dynamics. Granite is maybe one of the most peculiar and difficult to sort of wrap your head around, <laughs> to be honest, because it has all these predetermined fracturing planes that are probably there as soon as it's formed. And then in the case of Cannon, this is old rock. This was formed probably around 160 million years ago, deep in the subsurface, under a lot of pressure. And uh, it's also right on the edge, the boundary of the White Mountain Bathyless. So it's probably got some, you know, it's on a sort of a margin there. It's probably got some other complexities to it. And then it's been glaciated who knows how many times with all that uh, pressure and overburden from an ice sheet and then the release of the pressure. So it's, it's accumulated, I mean, so many fractures. And that's pretty much dictating how the rockfall happens as to where those fractures grow and how the weathering processes act upon those fractures. That's sort of where this has gone, um, but it would be totally different if this was sandstone or limestone or anything. I mean, uh, it's really fascinating to, to think about, but it would not be canon. It would be a whole different project. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop the share so we can see them. Oh, wait. <laughs> Uh, right. 
Uh, are rock climbers in danger of rock fall when climbing on Cannon Cliff? <laughs> um, absolutely, I guess would be, I mean, at any time, any outing at any climbing place, there's always a risk of rock fall um, and always be careful. Um, I mean, any like even if somebody said, I was just there and it was fine and yesterday, you know, it's like you never know. And at Cannon especially, um, we know there's rock fall all the time. So uh, there have been several fatalities at Cannon and at other places, um, much, much less intimidating than Cannon. So it's always, um, you know, it's always a risk of climbing, absolutely, so. Thanks. Uh, so the fatalities at Cannon were the result of the climbers flying loose some of those false cracks. Yeah. With detox of the old things. Right. Little yeah, off blocks to fall on top of themselves. Yeah, but it was human trick. Right. I mean, I guess no matter how experienced you are, uh, all bets are off at Canada, is what I would say, is what I've heard. And uh, I, I'm not actually a climber. I always joke that I'm one of the only Dartmouth or science students who's not a, not, not a climber. Um, but uh, I actually am less interested in climbing after this project. <laughs> so maybe Whitney Gilman. I might do Whitney Gilman today. But uh, yeah. Um, so then uh, another question is about the warming. So your data show uh, gradual warming of the rock. Is the rate of warming about the same as measured global warming due to climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, yeah, I can, well, um, are we still sharing? I think so. I'll show that. I think I think the answer is yes. It's very similar to the rate. Um, the rate of um, let's see if I did go last year. No. Um, anyway, the, the rate of um, warming of air temperature uh, that I found at Hubbard Brook oh, is between when using Hubbard Brook data. So in the whites is between three, around three and four degrees every hundred years. That's the sort of rate. So um, it's definitely close. I think it's it's about the same rate in the bedrock. And in a way that makes sense because the correlation that I found is pretty much one-to-one -one with a four to five degree offset, which is totally blows my mind. <laughs> I can't believe it's that, that that's the case. But um, so yeah, I think that's about the same. Uh, about the same rate. And then the other question that was there was, uh, what role does wind play in the weathering? Yeah, um, so wind definitely plays a big role. Um, we don't have any data on the actual wind speeds up there, but I know um, Brian has told me uh, about when they had seismometers up on the old man monitoring the how much vibration was uh, occurring on the old man uh, when they were blasting for the highway that Wind was by far the uh, biggest source of seismic, uh, basically activity detected. So the wind is strong up there. And in fact, one of my sort of theories, excuse me, um, I don't know, let's see, where is it? Um, one of my theories for that rock I showed with the different, um, let's see, right here, um, that sort of concrete channel here, is actually pretty much lined up here. And so another theory that I'm pondering <laughs> that I was talking with my advisor about is that you know wind and like water and rain and snow could be driving from the north here and pummeling this part of the granite and it could be shielded. And that's super interesting as well because um, basically that means that this all this weathering and deterioration has happened since the construction of the sluice way, <laughs> which would be, very interesting and a way to sort of date it. So that's another thing we're considering. Um, but yeah, I mean, the wind is, it's brutal up there. It is windy. And the wind's also gonna drive up the bay from the rain deeper into some of those cracks. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've got a couple of comments for your real thesis. <laughs> nice. So you should change your 10 to 12,000 years for deglaciation of the notch to maybe 13 to 14. Okay. Because we have radiocarbon ages from the bottom profile lake approaching 13. Yep. And we have beryllium 10 ages, exposure ages right. in the bedrock, starting about 14 up high 
down to maybe 13 and a half down to the valley for the right, right. So, so I'd go with greater than 13. <laughs> Meredith Kelly, maybe I can do that. So, <laughs> with the scar. yeah, I didn't know the number changes like the weather. So, I <laughs> the other is in this is in case Justin Strauss or something is very good. I would not use the word layers. Uh, Go, you, you use the word sheets and sheeting, which I think would be preferable. Mm. <laughs> because a lot of geologists like to say the word layers. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well taken. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and that group, uh, you showed a photo of a couple of climbers involving uh, as well. But if you want to do lake view, you don't have to do what they were doing. They're out of I think it was Constellation Prize. That's a fine thing. Lake view is a lot easier. So, yeah. <laughs> don't lake view with the rest of your <laughs> Yeah. No, you just have to do this and you'll enjoy it. Oh, cool. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, so um, and thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, as I said earlier, our events are supported by the New Hampshire Humanities, but the exhibition where you can see, uh, you can play with Matt's model upstairs, um, the support for that really comes from our members. So if you aren't already a member, I would encourage you to um, click on the link that, that Jade has already put on the chat. She's so on top of names, um, where you can um, go ahead and, and join um, this great community that, that supports us. Um, and for those of you in person, I have paper surveys over there. We'd love to hear what you thought about tonight's program. And if you have short stories about the old man of the mountain you wanna share with us. Um, and for those of you on Zoom, Jade has put the link in, in the chat. You can just click on that and fill out the survey. Kayla will also send um, a link in an email um, later on, but if you wanna, Fill that out while you're thinking of it. You can click right there and um, and let us know what you think. So again, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, we'll all be rooting for you on August 29th. <laughs> thank you. Okay. That's the real resolution. <laughs> thank you all.